So let's turn our attention to then some things from the Word of God. This is not my wordplay. I didn't come up with this. Others have said, I think the first time I heard this was uh, something that Delbert Rankin had prepared. And uh, I thought, well, that, that works. And I was thinking about it for reasons that I won't express this morning. But I was thinking about it over the last several weeks. Somebody had said something in a lesson. And uh, I thought, you know, that's, that's a good topic. Generally, this kind of thing comes up in uh, November, like the last Thursday of November. Right? <laughs> but I thought it was good to talk about it away from that day. Thanksgiving over time in America has taken on a whole different meaning. It has migrated away from being thankful for the bountiful production of the land and the promise of liberty and freedom to those that dwell in it to uh, four-day weekends, overeating, football, and uh, kamikaze shopping. <laughs> and I don't think that's really what God had in mind. I'm not saying that Thanksgiving is, is, is a bad thing, but the way that we keep it in this country, I think that any time people thank God at all, that's a good thing. It's a good practice. But we should do it with the proper attitude for the proper thing. And that is hopefully what I'm going to present today. Not yet. There we go. Starting in Romans 1. A lot of you may know this. I almost started the 16th verse, but I decided, no, nah, I'm going to save a little time here. For since the creation of the world is, and that's God's, invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. And maybe I should have put a little bubble there to say who they are. All of humankind is without excuse because the creation is enough evidence that there is a creator, that we have no excuse to not know that there's a God and pursue him. Because although they knew God, yes, and if you look back in all the cultures on this planet, there's a God in the past. And we'll talk more about where they went from there in their minds in a minute. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. The idea of futility and foolishness comes from this idea of having no future, nothing that will come of it. You say, well, many things have come of the world and it's thinking we have to look to the end of the plan of God to see that it will come to nothing. If it isn't designed, thought of, planned by God, it will come to nothing. Now, the degree to which we believe that may vary throughout the room, certainly does throughout the world. But the Bible, the Word of God, is written from the perspective of God. And the men that he, through his spirit, had write some of these things down consistently tell us that the ways of the world will come to nothing, the ways of God will prevail. They became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And I think we have to understand that it wasn't simply because they said, I'm wise. It's what they claimed made them wise. The inventions of their mind, they said, we've really come up with something that would be in the category that we've read before, futile, foolish. 
And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Yes, and as we see throughout pretty much every culture, and when I say culture, I'm talking about those that developed into what we have today. When we see the empires of the world, all the different tribal breakdowns of, of humanity, they all went through the process of having gods. Many of them came to multiple gods and idolatry, but they all went through that. Some of them in the last several centuries have come to the position that, of, of atheism, but they all began with this idea of God. Okay. That is the basis. This idea that where they turned the corner was when they looked at God, had a notion of God, that they did not glorify him and they were not thankful for what they have. Which what we're sitting in called planet Earth today is what they had. And all the things that came with that, all the binnies and food that came on planet Earth. Right? Because we all like vegetables, I'm assuming, right? We all eat some fruits and vegetables or meat. If, if it isn't that, then what are you eating? And we're all eating or we wouldn't be here today. There we go. Now we go to the book of Psalms. I'm going to read the entire 50th Psalm. And this, once again, is laying a foundation. The mighty one, God the Lord. And you can in, inject into that for the capitalized letters there. The name of God of Israel. God the Lord has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. How far are we looking to the future and, and how broad is that statement? Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. And those of you who know the prophecies of the coming of God think that this is a, a fair, if not an understatement. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. And so at this point, we're going to have a split. We're going to have people going one direction, and people going another direction. And first he's going to talk to the people that are going in a direction toward him and with him. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Okay. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your fold. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, I'm going to pause there for a minute and look at some of the things that we read. God says, I, I don't need you to feed me. I created all these animals. I know they're there. They're mine if I want them. If I'm hungry, I don't have to tell you give me something to eat. 
these are all my animals. I could eat them if I wanted to. And yet he goes on to say, offer thanksgiving. And he said, before, you've entered into a covenant with me through sacrifice. So what's he say? He says, I don't need this stuff, but I want you to be willing to sacrifice. I want you to give up the stuff that I've created. Why? Why does he want this? Why does he need us to interact with him in this way? It's not because of his needs. Anytime you have two people interacting, if it's not for one person's need, it's for the other. So what he's telling us is this whole idea of saying thank you and sacrificing is acknowledging God. He doesn't need the things that we have to sacrifice. He already owns them all. So that's what he says to the righteous. Says, I'm not, I'm not going to complain because you sacrifice. That's fine. But just understand, I don't need the things you're sacrificing. But I appreciate the sacrifice. Then he says to the wicked, what right have you to declare my statutes? or take my covenant in your mouth. It's annoying to me when I watch a TV show or a movie and they quote the Bible. First of all, it's annoying that they will pick some obscure reference and use that as some symbolic method. And yet the very simple truths and the very simple commandments of God they ignore and practice something absolutely contrary to that. And I'm glad to read that it bothers God too. What right have you to declare my statute or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him. I'm not a crook and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. By the way, that reference I made, some of you older people will probably have to explain that. So. <laughs> I'm not going to right now. Give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. Otherwise, he's going to line them up and say, here's what you did. Like bullet-pointed items. Here's what you did wrong. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. And this is kind of the crux of the issue. Whoever offers praise glorifies me. And to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. So not only do we have to live correctly, obey the word of God, but we have to praise him and in doing so glorify him. A few minutes ago, we said the Lord's Prayer. I'm not going to put that on the screen because I think a lot of you know it. Does Jesus say thank you in that prayer? Yeah. And yet, if you look that up in Matthew 6, it says, Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. You won't find the word thank you in that prayer. But based on this, whoever offers praise glorifies me. I'm not saying Jesus didn't say thank you in his prayers. There's one very classic prayer that he made in which he starts with thank you. You know where that's at? Yeah, he says, I thank you, but I don't know what he said in Greek. What the other words are. John 11, as he's just before he calls Lazarus out of the grave, 
He says, he looks up to heaven and says, I thank you, Father, that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. And I did this, I'm doing this because of those here today, so that they will know that you sent me. That was the prayer. So if we combine the prayers of Jesus, we see that not only did he thank his Father, but he glorified him because the Lord's Prayer is just that. It's an acknowledging of God being the Almighty, the Holy One of Israel, and acknowledging that it's by him that we eat, it's by him that we are forgiven, it's by him that we should forgive, and by him that we avoid temptation and evil and the evil one. Right? Offer praises or offering praises glorifies God. But there are the two things, right? Who orders his conduct aright, sets his life in the right order. Okay. Throughout time, it's been God's desire that his people live joyously. Really, that's if you look at his plan, the whole point is, in the end, joy and peace and love, or love, joy, peace. Did you read that somewhere? That's his desire. And we can see that in his commandments to have peace. So I'm going to read through just some of that. In Deuteronomy 16, verses 6 through 8. Well, actually, I'm going to go further than that, but that's where we're going to start on this screen. But at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide, that was different places at Shiloh, different places at Gilgal, uh, out in the wilderness, wherever they were. Eventually, Jerusalem. There you shall sacrifice the Passover at twilight, at the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt, early spring, when they keep the Passover. And you shall roast and eat it in the place which the Lord your God chooses, and in the morning you shall turn morning. it into your tents. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a sacred assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work on it. You shall count seven weeks for yourselves, Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. You shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of free will offering from your hand. Yeah, you have to bring something. You have to supply something. It's basically a potluck. Okay, you have to bring something. Which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. And this festival or this feast they did in early summer. So yeah, those things, right? so don't know. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God. I have that read. I do not want you to miss this. The whole point was God saying, this is not something you have to do. This is something you get to do. You get to, in praising me, eat lots of good food. I'm going to give you the food. All I'm asking is you come together and enjoy each other's company and acknowledge that I gave it to you. And not just these men that he was talking to, but he says you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your gates, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are among you at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days, when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press in early fall. So we have spring, summer, fall. He didn't make them go in the wintertime. And you shall rejoice in your feast. Once again, right? You and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, and the Levite, the stranger, the followers, the widow, who are within your gates. 
Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you surely rejoice. Three times a year all your males shall appear before your God, Yah, in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Everybody brings something. What do they bring? Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. And probably the closest thing we have to understanding this would be camp, because we're there for a week. And a lot of these things happen for seven days, right? They were there for a week, and each time, three times a year. Our potlucks, as I said, that we have our meals that we have together. Some of us get together on Thanksgiving and eat a big meal, and they're joyous. How do you understand joyous? What does that mean? Does it mean a drunken brawl? Would it, would it mean, in your mind, when you picture joyous, do you mean a people sitting around all stone-faced? Or do you picture people that are happy, that are joking, talking, smiling, laughing, enjoying themselves? Oh, enjoying. Wordplay? I think not. Yeah, what does it mean to enjoy? Okay. So we take these thoughts. Now we go to the New Testament. The principle. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. I want you to see this in that verse. Jesus sanctified the people with his own blood. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruits of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, huh, remember what we read in Psalm 50? That we enter into a covenant with God by sacrifices. I'm not going to put it on the screen for you, but I hope a lot of you know what it says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? Don't be, don't conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? And present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is wholly acceptable to God. This is really saying the same thing. It shouldn't surprise us. It could be the same author, right? Offer sacrifice of praise to God. Give thanks to his name. But don't forget to do good and to share. Because those are the sacrifices that pleases God. There's the principle. How do we do it? So now we're getting into this area of thanks living. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Pause there for a minute. I want you to think as parents. What makes you the happiest? Two scenarios. What makes you the happiest? You give a child a nice gift. And they, one of them goes, oh, thank you, thank you, profusely, right? And then you find it laying on the floor, or you find it laying out in the yard, and they, they don't take care of it. Or the kid that says, thank you, but you notice that they keep it clean, they keep it put away, they take care of it, they bring it out, and many years later, you find that they still have it. Which really said thank you? Which one glorified you through praise? 
Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. And we could go on for a long time on that phrase alone, right? Walk in love. That's the doing part, right? As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Remember, God does not need food from us. And when we cook food, if we do it right, we go, oh, that smells good, right? The sweet-smelling aroma. But we're talking a figurative sweet-smelling aroma here. A well-lived life. And by doing that, by living a life well, by imitating God, we are saying to God, thank you for everything that you gave us. He goes on to say, and here's, here's the, the other side, right? We have two different directions of travel here, as was pointed out in Psalm 50. We have those who are obedient to God and those who say, I forget God. And that's what it said there. They forget him. They, that's what we read in Romans 1. They aren't thankful, and they turn to their own futile plans. It says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetous, let it not even be named among you, and he's talking to the church here, as is fitting for saints. Neither foolishness, or excuse me, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So is he saying that no one can joke? Is he saying that no one can be happy and joyous in their conversation and in their reaction and relations with other people? I don't think so, because we already have the instructions for them to feast and eat and enjoy themselves. But you have to, to look at the words here that are interlaced with these ideas. Filthiness, foolish talking. Foolish talking would include anything that does not align with the plan of God. Coarse jesting. I think we would understand that is, what that is, which are not fitting, but rather give thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, wait, do we know this? This author says that the church should know this. This is what you should know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Sometimes I think we forget this part. We get so caught up in trying to understand the commandments and do what's right that we don't understand, we forget that God's initial goal was for his people to be joyous which should point something out. And this is what the people in the world that follow their passions to the point of self-destruction never seem to understand. That everything that is good, everything that is strong, everything that is lasting works within parameters. Right? Look at, look at even in science today. When they accomplish something through chemistry, through physics, through whatever, there's very stringent rules that have to be followed in order to produce that good product. If it gets sloppy and you let all the other stuff come in, if it doesn't remain pure, it fails. A godly life is the same thing. But what we have to remember is that it's God's desire that we live a joyful life. 
within the parameters that would produce joy, leaving out those things that are destructive. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Yeah, that's a statement. If you're not gentle to people, remember that God is watching. Be anxious for nothing, or don't worry about stuff. That's the opposite of being joyful, is when you're worried. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So still, everything's pointing at Him, right? Everything's focusing on Him. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And I hope that this reminds us of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, and all on. The, the proper behavior that we're supposed to exercise amongst other people and amongst ourselves. Colossians 2, 6 through 10. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. What are the basic principles of the world? Me. I want it, and I want it now. That's pretty much it. Instant gratification. I want it, and I want it now. Even if I have to pay more for it later, if I can get it now, I'll do that. But it also includes things like, well, there really isn't a God. Why isn't there a God? Because you scientifically can't prove that he exists. If you can't prove he exists, he's not there. I think we can prove he exists. I think everybody knows that there's proof that he exists. But they turn it off. Right? And it's not even complex things. It can be very simple things. If life raised out of some primordial soup was zapped into existence in a little puddle of water on a rock by lightning, or even if it was delivered here from another planet, you still have the same two basic questions. What made it alive, and what did it eat? The scientists today still can't tell you. You know, you'll say, what makes it alive? Well, they'll go off about that, but if you ask them this question, something was alive there, and it died. What did it lose? What just left? There's no answer. Because all the material is still there. Before it was alive, now it's not. What did it lose? Well, we think about this thing called the breath of life, right? The Spirit of God. But you can't prove that with science. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Well, you look around the day and you go, Jesus isn't running everything yet. The degree to which you believe in God and that you believe in the word of God is the degree to which you will believe that Jesus will eventually rule everything. I'm anxiously waiting that day. Thessalonians 1, 2-4. And we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering 
without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. We saw two very different trajectories in the wicked peace people and the righteous people going two different directions, two very different directions of travel. I'm really thankful for the truth of God as it's held by all the other people. It wouldn't be fun driving against traffic by yourself. And what we're doing is basically driving against traffic because most of the people in the world do not acknowledge God to the degree where they want to live according to his tenets. Yeah. And joy, for the most part, is a team activity. How many of you have ever gone to like a national park or something like that by yourself? And if you did, be honest with me, you stood there and went, wow, I wish so-and-so was here because they'd love this. Joy is a team activity. And I'm very thankful that we have the team. The extension. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. I'm going to stop there before I read the next section. We live in our community. We live amongst the people that we went to school with, all the people that we worked with. Are we thankful for those people? Sometimes they're the ones that give us fits, right? Give us problems. But we still should be thankful for all men or give thanks for all men. We have to interact. It's, it's a natural tendency, at least it is for me, to just go, okay, I'm going to cut myself off from all those people every way. But there's a hope and desire for God that all men will be saved, as we're going to read in a little bit here in this reference. And if we want that to happen too, we have to interact with other people. There's the times when we have to show our thankfulness for even those people in our community and through our kindness, through our good words, through the joy that we can have with them. There's things we can be joyous with them about. Not agreeing with them in all things, not going with them when they're misbehaving, but we still have to live with them as neighbors and people in the community. And he goes on to say, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Last text, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. So we bring all these things together. That Praising God is, in fact, glorifying God, which is equal to thanking Him, living like Him, doing what He wants us to do, is, in essence, thanking Him. These are three verses. If you want to ever memorize three verses, these are three easy ones to learn. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let's close with a song.
Our almighty God and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you today to acknowledge you for all the greatness that you have, all the gifts that you have given us, for we know that all good gifts are from you. We pray that you would find us acceptable in your eyes, that you would forgive us when we fail you. We do pray that you will be with all of your people that are scattered across the earth to guide and protect and comfort and heal as fits within your plan and your love. Until the day that you send Jesus back, may that day be soon, and may we be granted a place in your kingdom then. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 